Super Jump inside. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, first of all, my learnings from Professor Paul, after having followed him now for a few days, is that, first of all, the entire basis for the Norwegian health, uh, health policy and uh, radiation regulations is simply wrong. It is written into this document here from Folkehelseinstituttet, Report 200 and, uh, 2012, number 3. It is simply to be discarded, together with similar radiation regimes in many other countries, because they are all based on the thermal paradigm, saying that what we pay attention to is heating. And everything does not, which does not prove heating is not relevant. So we have to ask ourselves at least the, the following two questions. Do we know enough not to worry? And I think the answer is clearly no. Secondly, do we know enough to worry? And I think the answer is also clearly yes. And on that basis, we can draw the conclusion that here we have strong indications of a precautionary approach. It's as simple as that, as far as I can understand. And then we are about joining this whole list of doctors and scientists that I discovered while I was still working in Telenor uh, that had been calling for regulations or a moratorium as to the wireless technology deployment. Okay, so all this happened while I was sleeping. And um, together with many others in the industry, surely, uh, that all these uh, kinds of uh, conclusions were reached in uh, my research. And uh, in that uh, sense, or in a way then, Professor Paul's message comes as a late lesson from early warnings. How did we handle such findings? And I am glad I can say that I am not speaking neither of myself nor of any of the, of the colleagues, as far as I know of, that I have had over the years. But how the business worldwide handled these things. First of all, we denied the facts, or we invented facts. Like the one here from uh, the Boston CT IA in the United States, which is the branch or the industrial organization of telecommunications, who said in 1993 that we, when, some, when the problem came up, that we have at least 10,000 studies over the past 40 years that have confirmed that there is no evidence linking cellular phones and health hazards. 10,000. Then he asked George Carlos, who was his, um, he, uh, uh, he had employed at the time, a researcher, to go out and find studies, because he had no clue whether there were any or not. Uh, we lobbied against restrictive regulations. And I underscore, I'm not talking neither of myself nor of anyone I knew about. We spurred biased science and uh, product defense, no matter by which mechanism, I can't tell. But at least we can, it is reflected in the uh, scientific reports and the way it was financed that uh, here we have one, uh, uh, one table showing the results from cell phone 
and br brain tumor studies, depending on how it has been financed, whether from industry or from independent sources. And we see that uh, the number of tumors they found is much lower in the industry financed uh, than in the independently financed. We see that the, um, uh, uh, the, score, the, the percentage of malignant tumor, tumors is much lower in the industry financed than in the uh, uh, non-independently financed. And we even see that the risk of uh, the risk in increase you get by using cell phones compared to not using cell phones is uh, found to be much lower in the industry financed than in the independently financed. How come? There may be hundreds of ways that this might, might happen, more or less moral. But that is the pattern, no, no matter how it came about. Okay, we fought for delays and misinformation, and I think a good uh, example is the SAR, the specific absorption rate, which might have been a landmark in a way of measuring, uh, measuring radiation at some time. Uh, it is very technical, I don't understand much of this, but I understand uh, what, it, uh, uh, what it implies. That, this is the measurement that you can find uh, included when you buy a new mobile phone. It will tell you with the SAR value of, of your mobile phone. It's so-called specific absorption rate. It's based on the heat paradigm, which at the outset should disqualify it. But more than that, it is based on the following conditions. And then we, each of us might think about if we or up to these conditions or not, you should be 186 and weigh 96 kilos. You should be an adult male. You should have strong health. Uh, the cell phone should be kept at least two and a half centimeters away from your head. You should never talk for more than six minutes because it's measuring whether there could be one degree heat generated in, in, uh, within six minutes. You, uh, your brain should consist of a homogeneous mass. And you should have no wounds, because there the, cell, uh, the cells are multiplying faster, so the risk is higher. Uh, there should be no accumulated impact from radiation. And there should be a simple uh, dose-response relationship, which uh, Mr. Paul just told us told us that there is not. So it is irre irrelevant for all of us. And that is what we are giving, giving them. Why is it like that? The, the only answers I can find for myself is that this is an, this, uh, are results of extreme tunnel vision, which what we in business call focus. Um, it gives a higher NPV, net present value, of the projects that any other strategy. So it wins. Although many of us would not like it to win, it, uh, it wins. Uh, we had the wrong choice of experts, those who told that harm could not happen. We were fighting also for human welfare and progress, because that was what, why, why, what many of us believed in, that this was the road to that, and that made good sense in the era of techno-optimism. So it ends up in a way that to have, uh, or to, to be the same scheme as with tobacco, asbestos, pesticides, greenhouse effects, and others. Are we going into the same mess with smart meters? Well, I did a little study on smart meters some years ago. I wasn't th thinking about uh, the uh, EMF at the time. But uh, other things that I was a bit critical to, but then uh, I tried to find a little bit about the EMS, uh, the, the EMF, and found that, uh, well, one such meter that transmits then via a SIM card, for example, um, normally, uh, it might just be on 45 to 60 seconds per day between your meter and the electricity provider. But that's just a small part of the story. 
Because in addition to that comes the internal communication with the fridge, with your, with your washing machine, with your whatever it is that should ex exchange data, either over the, the, um, the fixed network in your house or wirelessly. And uh, then you, you, I guess you have some beacon signals, that is uh, the meter saying, hello, here I am, I am. do anyone want to communicate with me? like the wireless routers do. And the wireless routers, they normally do that 100 times a second. And um, then you might have spikes from the meter I have seen uh, listed. They may be up to between 4,000 and 190,000 a day. And here is some measurements made by someone who is here in the audience. Uh, where he found that, uh, well, according to the present values, the uh, radiation uh, measured at a specific meter installation in, 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 a, in a city in uh, south of Norway uh, corresponds to just half of a percentage of uh, the ceiling of, uh, of what is permitted then, of radiation. But if you compare it with biological-based uh, values, it's 24 times higher than the recommended max value of the European Council. And if you compare it with the uh, target values of the European Council, it is 250 times too much, what he measured. So, we have to ask ourselves, what should we do now, when we are in this situation? I think uh, we should, first of all, of course, uh, go back to ISO 26000, which is a quite, quite a suitable framework for, uh, for working with these kind of things, and take a look on two, the fundamental concepts there. There are two fundamental practices of social responsibility. You have to recognize your social responsibility, which means both to understand what it is, accept that you actually have some kind of responsibility, and uh, say it aloud, and, to, uh, and you have to identify your stakeholders and engage them, uh, and uh, engage with them. Then, you would have to uh, take into account the principles of social responsibility, which means all this, that you, there is a need for building in-house competence on EMF, CSR, and strategy. And uh, just to, uh, to make a long story very short about how you could go about to make, should we say, the extreme practical case of how you go about in an organization when using this, uh, this uh, kind of methodology, you could just set up a kind of table like this, where you take each column here with human rights, labor practices, the environment, fair operating practices, consumer issues, and uh, community involvement, and so on, and the principles here, and then you start filling in. Uh, do we, what would uh, corporate social responsibility mean for us? Uh, as to EMF, as to labor practices and, for example, respect for stakeholder interests. Could it, for example, be generate a discussion about wireless workspace? Is wireless workspace a smart thing or is it not? I thought it was a very smart thing. It was very fancy when we started working wirelessly. After what we have heard now, it's not very smart. Uh, Wireless homes, wireless classrooms has to be discussed. It's a consumer issue, among others. The localization of masts, that has to do with the community and the community involvement and all that kind of things. And like that, we could go on and fill in and fill in and fill in. Should we work along the supply chain, for example, to uh, make sure that uh, not only are the, the equipment that we are buying um, uh, uh, adapted such that the EMF is as low as possible, uh, but also uh, is the work environment where they are actually producing it as EMF free as possible or as uh, feasible. And so we could go on discussing 
in each and every corner of the organization these various cells of the table. Okay. And also, when the authorities are lagging behind, it's uh, the, the whole point with corporate social responsibility is that the corporate organization should be a spearhead. Otherwise, corporate social responsibility doesn't mean that much. Which means educate ourselves, don't rely on authorities' competence when we see that it is lacking. We should show the sincereness that we have by immediate measures. There could be many of them. Trim down the antenna powers. We could start low instead of starting high. We could sell wireless routers which were adjusted to the lowest instead of to the highest. Uh, today you buy it uh, with the peak performance and then you can adjust it down if you are particularly interested and find out how you do it. And uh, there could be much more to adjust. I, this summer before I, when I started to understand what these things were about, I bought three wireless routers from the Netherlands because there I could ad adjust much more than the ones I found here in this country. Okay, we could hand out metal protection kits, kits of the kind that uh, Professor Paul was talking about. We could inform customers, give them uh, better advices than showing them the SAR values. And we could also show the kind of information that we dislike, like the results from the, uh, the, uh, the effects from... Uh, on, uh, or the biological effects from various kinds of uh, experiments. Yeah. Uh, we could develop diagnostic tools like, like this one, which is soon coming out from Finland, where you can uh, monitor the radio frequency exposure of your own uh, uh, from your mobile uh, and uh, how much you are exposing yourself to. It runs on your mobile. You, we could educate and develop the authorities. We have a long tradition for that. Start Oil, the Oil Directorate, Telenor, SN Power, and other institutions uh, or uh, uh, market organizations in Norway have built up competence of oil administration in Angola, Mozambique, of uh, the uh, telecom regulations in Bangladesh and other places, and so on. And now we have to do the same with Folkehelse Institute, Staten Sterolevan, and the Health Directorate, for example, it seems. We should engage in joint efforts with the authorities, and we should take responsibility and build better standards for the industry. Engage in that, and lobby, of course, for immediate industry-wide measures. And also, what I've written here, provide incentives, of course, for both radical and incremental innovation. We both need them both. Okay. There are good examples of such practice. One particularly good is the pace, pacemaker problem in the United States around 1994, when they discovered that a third of the, uh, when they tested uh, cell phones, a third of them created problems for people with pacemakers. Of course, and first, mobile business wanted to give the... Uh, they claimed that that was a pacemaker problem, and the pacemaker pro uh, pro uh, producer said that it was a cell phone problem, of course. And, uh, but then they started to work well together, and it, they solved it in 24 months. Working together... So, there are many fruits to pick. Some of them are short-term and hanging low, like consciousness rising campaigns, cell phone and Wi-Fi free schools and blocks, no smart meters without cabling. There is actually at least one company in Norway, Norway selling smart meters which are connected by wire, uh, as far as I've heard. You know much more about all this. Um, and revitalize the landlines and uh, the traditional phones, of course. I did not think, I wouldn't imagine that would happen, but I just reopened my fixed form. Uh, then, of course, marketing and development of sustainable ICT, so-called protection equipment. Yeah, the kind of things we have talked about. 
And then there are long-term things like return cell towers. There's an Israeli company uh, suggesting uh, new ways of building cell phone towers that will decrease the, uh, the uh, effect or the strength that your mobile phone is, um, is sending with by having specific return towers. Um, so there are a lot of things you can do of, on the, um, along the uh, technology line and uh, uh, yes, others. For example, have to, to, to make roadmaps as to how you shall tra uh, transit from wireless to cable. And uh, uh, yes, of course, we need research find, uh, funding, but it has to be with hands off. Uh, Yes. And of course, investigate impact of animals and plants. As I started digging into it, I found that, well, plants don't have uh, VGCC, but they have similar things. So it might be they are affected. There are several reports on that. Uh, yes, do scenario studies as to how, uh, what the EMF safe society would, or safe enough society, would look like. What could that be? Okay, what are the odds for success? Maybe they are low, for several reasons here. Uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't try. And if you don't make it, then uh, we have to cry for measures in line with the Constitution, uh, Revision 2000 and when was it? 13, which has built the precautionary principle into the paragraph 112. Thank you very much. Uh...